The idea of my talk this morning is to, to give a, a broad perspective of what we're talking about when we talk about air quality and ventilation in homes, of which damper mould is part of that jigsaw puzzle. I want to talk a little bit about air quality and why it matters, why it should be important to us all, uh, and really what we mean by ventilation and the basics, how we get better outcomes in the homes and start to think about where this is all going with strategies and environmental monitoring of spaces. Um, and there's an unbelievably cute dog at the back there, I've just spotted, it's going to be completely distracting. <laughs> but, um, I wear an awful lot of hats, but amongst them uh, is that I'm the fa Hi! Uh, is that I'm the, the founder of Air Quality Matters. It's a consultancy where principally I advise organisations on ventilation and air quality strategies. Um, I host a, a podcast by the same name where we, we speak to people from all over the world about this subject. Um, but I also do things like chair the International Energy Agency's Annex on Air Quality and Ventilation, their Industry Advisory Council and their Scientific Committee, uh, and plenty more besides. If we're lucky enough to live to 80 years of age, we're going to spend close to 70 years of that time indoors. And if you're vulnerable, or from certain parts of the community, or some, from certain parts of the world, we can spend considerably more than that indoors. So it doesn't matter, actually, whether we're talking about indoor air quality or outdoor air quality, the vast majority of our exposure to even outdoor air quality will occur indoors. We'll spend close to 55 years of that time in our own homes. So again, the vast majority of our exposure to all air pollutants, the single biggest environmental risk we face as a human species will occur in our own homes. 25 years of that time asleep in a single room. So this stuff is incredibly important. But what do we mean by air quality? If I was to take a jar right now and close the lid on it, what would actually be in that jar, that invisible void within the glass? Well, of course, the vast majority of any of you cast your mind back to school chemistry is gases, nitrogen, oxygen, and some other stuff. We get a little bit interested in CO2, which takes up about half a percent of that gas these days because it's reflective of global warming and it's why many of us are here today. But what we're talking about today is the stuff we don't want to see in that jar. The pollution, the mould spores, the gases, the chemicals that cause us harm. And what do we really mean by that? How do we start to frame that risk? Well, there's been some great work carried out recently that started to characterise all of the pollutants that we find in homes the same that we occupy, our homes, our tenants' homes, homes throughout this part of the world. The vast majority of it is ethanol um, and other pollutants that you may or may not be familiar with, things like particulate matter and formaldehydes and nitrogen dioxide. There's a big pea soup of chemicals and gases and particulate matter that can cause us harm. And we can spend the next 20 years researching and trying to figure out how they interact with each other and so on. But the reality is some of them cause us more harm than others. So what we're interested in is of those pollutants that we find indoors, what's causing us harm? Well, one of the ways we can do that is to look at things like DALIs, Disability Adjusted Life Years, and it's a public health measure that characterises the impact of early death and years lost to disability through a particular risk. So to give you some context, smoking causes around 2,400 years loss to early death and disability per 100,000 of the population and clearly is considered as an unacceptable risk and we put an awful lot of funding into trying to reduce that risk to the population. Alcoholism is somewhere around 1,000 years lost and traffic deaths around 1,200 years lost to early death and disability. 
to give you some sense, if we map dalis to those pollutants we find in the home, they're equivalent to over 2,200 years lost to early death and disability. So twice as harmful as alcoholism and road traffic deaths. They are a significant concern. But interestingly, when we start to map that out, it clears that picture up somewhat. We start to see that they are no surprise to any of us in the indoor air quality community, but most of the harm is caused by four or five major pollutant groups. They are particulate matter, that's fine dust particles that float in the air that we breathe in and cause us harm. Things like formaldehyde, which is off-gassing of chemicals from a lot of building materials, nitrogen dioxide from combustion products within the home, and radon and ozone. Interestingly, this little blue square here is bioaerosols, which would include mould spores. So it's number six on the list. So it might be surprising to some people today that we're talking about damp and mould, but it might represent such a small fraction of this. The truth is it's, it's a, it, it can be characterised within particulate matter as well to some degree, so there's a little bit of double counting in that graph. But we have a good understanding now of what is causing us harm in the built environment. And be under no illusion, this stuff causes us harm. Indoor air quality, or air quality in general, is the single biggest environmental risk we face. It's associated in the UK with somewhere between 28,000 and 36,000 deaths per year, and it affects the poorest in society the most. The estimated cost of air pollution, and bearing in mind the vast majority of our exposure to that air pollution will occur in our own homes, is estimated at somewhere close to 20 billion a year just in this country alone. And we can break that down even further we just look at a couple of those examples from the previous screen. Radon is associated with somewhere close to 1,100 deaths from lung cancer in this country alone, a, a risk we know how to manage. Um, according to the Asthma and Lung UK Society, 5.4 million people currently live with asthma in the UK, a disease we know is significantly exacerbated by poor indoor environments. My favourite stat is, in Ireland, which has one of the highest incidences of asthma in Europe, every four minutes in a country of five million people, bearing in mind, somebody is admitted to hospital with asthma. And this affects real people. We have our Bishak, who obviously died as a direct result of exposure to damp and mould in the home that he lived in. But also we have uh, Ella Kissy Debra. Uh, who died at the age of nine as a direct result of the quality of the air that she breathed in and around her home in South London. And she was the first case in the UK where the coroner's report directly, directly attributed her death to the quality of the air that she breathed. And Ella's law was just voted down in the House of Commons in the last couple of months, um, as often these things are politically, that look to improve air quality in London and the rest of the UK. And of course, talking about um, our Bishak, we're talking about damp and mould, and it's why we're here today. So we start to talk about moisture in buildings. And the interesting thing about moisture in buildings is it not only has the ability to impact our health directly, it also has the ability to impact the health and sustainability of our stock that costs us an inordinate amount of money every year to maintain and manage and resource and upkeep. So Hector is going to go into more detail about damp and mould, but I want to introduce the concept that we're starting to think of damp and mould in less binary terms and more in more sophisticated, nuanced terms of moisture balance in buildings. This sophisticated interplay of building fabric and systems and occupancy and context that affects a building's healthy balance point. And all of them have the ability to interact with one another. This isn't a case of fixing a ventilation system and the problem is solved, or upgrading a window and the problem is solved. We have to find a more nuanced approach. 
in how we deal with this problem. So we have this interplay of systems, which is ventilation and heating systems. We have the fabric of the building, obviously. We have the activity that occurs within the dwelling and the use of that building. And as we've all learned in the last couple of years, the importance of context, things like fuel poverty and cost of living crises. It doesn't matter how efficient your building is, if you can't keep your building above 14 degrees, you're going to have problems with damp and mould. But without question, ventilation is a key pillar in the management and reduction of moisture load within the building. And it's one of the areas in housing that we get wrong time and time again. And it's not just a quality assurance and a governance issue. Often it's a perception issue. It's a misunderstanding of what we're trying to achieve with adequate ventilation. Here's a simple example of natural ventilation. Everybody here, I'm sure, has homes where you've got holes in the wall, where the air comes in and you've got fans that go on in the bathroom. But very rarely do we sit and try and understand what the lived experience of somebody living with this type of ventilation system is and how we might frame that and understand how to communicate that better to get better outcomes. A simple example is here, what do we think the lived experience of natural ventilation is for somebody in that living room? Well, their experiences is cold air coming in that vent. So their interpretation of adequate ventilation in that circumstance may be a cold draft where they turn it off. What's the experience of somebody in the bedroom? People struggle to answer that question because the experience of ventilation in that space is nothing. Air is going out of that room, in that particular room, so there are no drafts. So even within a single space, people's interpretation of the performance or not of a ventilation can be very different just by the mechanisms that are, are happening. And we don't stop to think about what we're asking of a ventilation system very often. Here is an example of an extract system, a continuous extract system. We're asking those two fans in that house to deliver the entirety of that airflow rate for that building. We're not relying on cross ventilation anymore. We're relying on mechanical systems to drive that. But very rarely do we stop and think, what am I asking of that system and how do I tell that it's delivering what I need it to? And this is where we need to start maturing our thinking about ventilation and outcomes. So we, we have plenty of regulations. Their intent and their standards are quite clear at this stage. But often we don't think about the things that deliver adequate ventilation and the cost associated with the upkeep and the delivery of that. For example, it doesn't matter what ventilation type you have. If you don't provide adequate undercuts under every door, no ventilation system is going to work the single biggest reason for non-compliance of ventilation systems in the industry is the provision of adequate undercuts under doors. The problem is it's not the plumber's job to put an undercut under the door, it's a separate trade. So often there's a misalignment of responsibility and accountability for something that is absolutely critical in the successful delivery of ventilation. But let's look at the basic numbers even. Here is a really good example in this case of what we call a Scottish four in a block layout. And it's a 55 square meter apartment. It's a tiny little apartment. But the ventilation requirements for that house to provide adequate ventilation, and this is not a lofty aspiration, this is the minimum entry point that's determined as adequate, requires that building because it's got two bedrooms to deliver 25 litres a second whole house rate to be deemed adequate. That's the minimum you should be doing. Now that means each one of those bathrooms, the, the bathroom and the kitchen now have to share 25 litres a second each. That's 12 and a half litres a second of ventilation, seven days a week, 24 hours day, a day permanently. I can tell you that 85% of the products that are sold into the market aren't capable of doing that in a sustainable way. So if we flip the narrative 
on ventilation and start to ask the question, what performance do we require? We can start to get better outcomes in what we see on the ground. And things are changing, whether you like it or not. We're going to start to be held accountable for the performance of ventilation systems through the likes of the Housing Ombudsman and the Regulator for Social Housing and building standards and so on. But creeping up behind us is environmental monitoring, whether we like it or not. Within the next 10 decades, there's not many spaces we'll occupy where we won't have live data of the environmental performance coming out of them. And these sensors can tell us about fuel poverty, the risks of voids, the thermal efficiency of buildings, their moisture risk and whether they're likely to be at condensation or whether the ventilation is performing adequately or not. Enormously rich data is possible from very, very cheap sensors indeed. Which means we now need to start thinking about ventilation strategies. It's no good now just saying, I specify extract fans for all bathrooms when they're being refurbished, or if we don't hear it making a noise, we replace it with a new one. We're going to have to start asking ourselves different questions because we will get started to be held accountable. So we need to start diagnosing the challenge much more significantly. Where does ventilation go right and wrong in our stock? How do we come into contact with it? When do we have an opportunity to enact change? What stakeholders internally and externally can we influence to get better outcomes? And more questions besides. But a decent strategy starts with a proper diagnosis of the challenge and then the building of guiding frameworks and policies around that challenge to deal with the nature of the problem. And that might be, do we have internal competency within our organisations to assess ventilation? Do we start delivering performance-based specifications to our products? Do we introduce capacity in design? Do we have commercial rigour in our contracts? All of these things can be embedded within policies that will start to deliver better outcomes. And the great thing about ventilation is that when we start to enact this and start to develop decent, coherent procedures and workflows behind these policies, we see change. And the great thing is, is if we're dealing with ventilation for damp and mould, the chances are we're going to be dealing with all of those other pollutants I was talking about as well. So not only do we have an impact on people's health and well-being from a damp and mould perspective, we're also having an impact on their health and well-being from their exposure to other pollutants within the building as well. That's my presentation. Thank you.